So in 2007, I had a chance to meet Kobe Bryant for the first time, and he said something to me that fundamentally changed my life, my perspective, and my approach moving forward. I, I had a chance, I was working in the Nike Skills Academies, and I had a chance to watch one of Kobe's really early workouts, like 4 a.m. type early. And I remember as a young coach, I was really surprised that he was just drilling down on some really basic drills and fundamentals, like stuff that I know you guys learned even in middle school. You know, it was pivoting drills, it was squaring up drills, but very basic stuff. And as a young coach, this really surprised me uh, because I expected to see at that time the best player in the world doing some flashy stuff. And he just kept drilling down on, on the fundamentals. And when I asked him about it later that day at camp, I mean, I literally said to him, you're the best player in the world. Why were you doing such basic drills? That's when he said something that changed my life forever. He said, the best never get bored with the basics. And I don't know how obvious that is to you all right now, because I know you guys are young, but that shifted my perspective because I realized that the key to being successful on the court or off and the key to being elite in any area of your life is working towards mastery of the fundamentals, primarily during the unseen hours. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the unseen hours are, but it's making a commitment towards working towards the basics. See, it's been my experience that in every area of life, but especially in basketball, complexity undermines execution. Like the more you try and make this game more complicated than it needs to be, the harder the game becomes. Uh, this is a very, very basic game at its premise. Now, one of the most important things <clears throat> for you guys to understand is there is a difference between basic and easy. Those things don't mean the exact same thing. What it takes to be an elite level player is very basic. But as you guys know, it's not easy. Shoot, what it takes to win a national championship is very basic in theory, but it's arguably one of the hardest things for anybody to ever do. So there's a difference between basic and easy and you have to know those. I mean, ultimately, you all have the North Star of winning a national championship. And you have the tools and you have the resources, you have the talent, you have the coaching staff, you have everything you need to be able to accomplish that goal. But in order to do that, it comes down to two things. There's two things that define whether or not you guys will be able to win at a consistent clip and whether or not you guys will be the ones that cut down those final nets. And those two things are preparation and performance. Everything comes down to preparation and performance. So let's talk for a few minutes about preparation. And that's when we're talking about what you all choose to do and the commitment that each and every one of you makes during the unseen hours. And what are the unseen hours? It's those times when no one else is watching. It's when the lights aren't on, the cameras aren't rolling, the cheerleaders aren't dancing. It's when you make the decision, as Coach mentioned yesterday, to watch extra film, to prepare yourself for your scrimmage against TCU. It's when you choose to come in an hour early or stay an hour late to work on a certain move, work on your game, or get up extra shots. It's when you choose to have the discipline to put yourself to bed at an, a better hour so that you have the requisite sleep so that you feel prepared the next day to give your best effort and make a maximum contribution. So it comes down to preparation. Now, the coaching staff, and you have the best coaching staff in the world, is going to do everything in their power to arm you all with the preparation that you need. But that's all they're doing is handing the baton off to you. Each and every one of you has to make the commitment to personally prepare for everything you do. Everything you do. How many of you guys have your own personal pre-game routine? Or pre-game, like how do you, do you guys have a pre-game routine yourselves? Not what the coaches tell you to do. Do you know how much sleep you need, what foods to eat, what music you like to listen to, what stretches you prefer to do? Do each of you have a pre-game routine? This is where you can either nod or say something. Yes. Awesome. Do each of you have a pre-practice routine? Do you wait for practice to start or do you prepare for practice to start? See, there's only one of two. Those are the only two options for players. Elite level players don't wait for anything to start. Elite level players prepare for everything to start. So that would be my next question. Do you have a pre-practice preparation routine? And then the question after that is, how similar is that to your pre-game routine? If you only take games seriously, but you don't take practice seriously, then you won't be the player that you're capable of. And you certainly won't be the team that you're capable of. So preparation during the unseen hours is the number one separator for players and for teams. 
The second, as we just mentioned, would be performance. How well do you all perform individually and collectively when the lights come on and the referees start blowing their whistles? And in the game of basketball, the name of the game is execution. Obviously, you have to play hard. Obviously, you have to play smart. Obviously, you have to play together. But ultimately, the teams that win <clears throat> are the ones that execute. Now, as I said, basketball is a pretty simple game in theory. If you break basketball down to its most fundamental component, I'm going to tell you right now what you need to do to put yourself in a position to win every single game you play. It's pretty basic. On offense, you need to take the highest percentage shot possible. On defense, you need your opponent to take the lowest percentage shot possible. I know that's really basic, but think about that. If consistently every offensive possession, you take the highest percentage shot possible, and consistently every defensive possession, you make them take the lowest percentage shot possible, do you know what the result is from that? You win and you win consistently. And every single time one of you makes a decision, conscious or unconscious, that does something that has your team take a lower percentage shot possible, or you do something that allows them to take a higher percentage shot, in that moment, you just decrease your team's chance of being successful. That's why in the game of basketball, everything matters. Every possession matters. And collectively, if you guys can stick to doing that as consistently as possible, because don't worry about perfection. Basketball is not a perfect game. In the history of this game, a perfect game has never been played at any level. There has never been a game where there were zero missed shots, zero turnovers, or zero fouls committed. So it's not a perfect game. So don't worry about perfection. But you guys need to be inspired by progress. And most importantly, you need to be committed to excellence. So that's what you need to do to win. You prepare like champions, and then you perform like champions. Don't make it any harder than that. Now, I want to talk about the three traits of elite level players and then the three traits of elite level teams. And the reason we're going to start with players is because ultimately a team is comprised of a collection of individuals, but individuals that choose to put we before me. But let's talk about what you guys need to do to be elite level players. The first thing is you have to learn how to blend confidence with humility. Where does confidence come from? Confidence comes from demonstrated performance. It comes from putting in the work during the unseen hours. Confidence comes from putting in the work during the unseen hours and getting in the repetitions. And let's not get it twisted. How do you get good at anything? Repetition and practice. So you guys have to understand, repetition is not punishment. Repetition is the oldest and most effective form of learning and skill acquisition on the planet. You want to get good at anything, but specifically the skills of basketball, it comes down to repetition, repetition, repetition. With minimal exception, you know who the best shooters are on the planet? The ones who put in the most reps during the unseen hours. It's cause and effect. It's not luck. So first and foremost, you have to earn the right to be confident. And you earn the right through demonstrated performance during the unseen hours. But the second part of that is you have to continue to be humble. See, when you're humble, you're humble enough, that means you're going to prepare. That means you don't take any opponent lightly. When you're humble, it means you stay open to coaching because there is a tremendous amount of basketball wisdom and experience in this room. Humility is what allows you to stay open to coaching. Humility is, allow is what allows you to say, no matter how good of a player you are, and you guys are elite level players, no matter how good you are, humility is what says, I can still get better. I don't care how good I am or how good everyone else says I am, I know I can still get better. So when you can learn to blend earned confidence through the humility of knowing that you still have a lot to learn in this game and can still get better, that's the first step to becoming an elite player. The second step to becoming an elite player is learning how to play present. And what do I mean by play present? Play present means that you are focused on the moment that's right in front of you. You don't worry about the past and you're not anxious about the future. If you're worried about the turnover that just happened or the missed shot that just happened or the referee's failure to make a call that just happened, if you're wasting your energy on something that just happened in the past, that means you are not fully present to invest that energy in the present moment where you can still actually make a difference. So you can't worry about the past. 
You also can't be worried about the future. You got five minutes left in the game and your mind is worried about whether or not you're going to win the game, which is five minutes into the future. It means you're not fully present with the task at hand. You have to be focused on the play that is directly in front of you. Second part of that is you have to learn how to control the controllables. I'm a huge believer there's only two things in this world that each and every one of us can control 100% of the time. And that's our effort and our attitude. Each and every one of you has the ability to control your effort and your attitude 100% of the time. And you need to learn how to let go and untether from the things you have no control over. Do you know how much control you have over what he says and what he does? No. Yeah, absolutely zero. You know how much control you have over what Coach Oates yells at you from the sideline? Zero. You know how much control you have over what the fans say? Zero. You know how much control you have over whether or not the referee makes a call? Zero. So think about that from a mathematical standpoint. And I know you guys love math because you're big in analytics here. Any emotional currency you invest into something that you have 0% control over is completely futile. It's a waste of your time and effort. But let's look at the things we do have control over, your effort. Working hard is a choice. You all choose whether or not you work hard on any given possession or any given day or any given practice. But here's what most people don't own. There has to be another side of that coin. If working hard is a choice, then not working hard yeah, that's also a choice. Not working hard is a choice. And it can't be a choice that you consistently make if your goal is to be the best player you're capable of or collectively be the best team that you're capable of. So giving the best effort possible as consistently as possible has to be the standard. Now let's look at attitude. And attitude's more about not what happens to you, but how you choose to respond. How do you choose to respond after a missed shot? After a turnover? after referee misses a call, after a teammate makes a mistake. That's what's called bounce back. Elite players have what's called bounce back. And it's something you can measure. You measure someone's body language, facial expressions, and effort after a play does not go their way. After you miss a wide open three foot uncontested jumper, which of course is disappointing. No one wants to miss that shot. But now that play is over. It's in the rear view mirror. It's in the past that is unchangeable. So what is your reaction after you miss an easy shot? Do you hang your head? Do you pout? Do you have bad body language? <clears throat> or do you sprint back on defense and try and earn it? So that's the attitude part. And then the third pillar of being an elite level player is trusting in the process. Is the process of what it takes to be a good player or an elite level player. What's some of the process of being an elite level player? Taking care of your body, taking care of your skills, taking care of your mind, all the things that go into that, you have to trust the process. See, we don't control outcomes, but we have a much more firm grasp of controlling the process, which is why you guys have to have that type of routine. You have to have a, a, a excellence is not something that's haphazard. It's not something that's luck. Would you guys agree that the more successful your practices are, then the more successful you'll play when the games come on? Right. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what can I do to make practice more successful? How can I make a maximum contribution to practice? And a lot of this comes down to standards. Who do you all think is the best shooter to ever play this game? Curry's at least in the conversation, right? So at that Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, Curry was one of the uh, college counselors. And I was just meeting him for the first time as well. Now this is before he kind of blew up and became the Stephen Curry that we're all aware of now. This was after his sophomore year at Davidson. And at the end of that first workout at the Skills Academies, he came up to me and he tapped me and said, Coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Think about that for a second. As a standard of excellence, he will not leave the gym until he swishes five free throws in a row. You guys are elite level players and many of you are elite level shooters. Can you admit that's a pretty high standard? Swishing five in a row? It means you swish four in a row, you still hit the rim on the fifth one, it still goes in. You're still five for five, you're still mathematically perfect. That wasn't good enough for Steph. He'd start over. 
And if memory serves, I don't think it ever took him longer than 15 minutes to swish five in a row. So you guys believe he's the best shooter on the planet. I agree with you, but it's not by accident and it's not by luck. It's because he's willing to hold himself to a high standard. So you guys got to figure out what are the standards you need to set for yourself to be an elite level player. And it doesn't have to be five swishes in a row on free throws. You got to figure out for yourself what it needs to be. So that's what it takes to be an elite level player. However, this is not an individual sport. This, this is basketball, which means it's a team game. It's a we over me game. So now let me just share the three components of an elite level team. I'll, I'll button it up with one last story and then I'll be, I'll be done and you guys can get on with your film session. So here are the three components of elite level teams. They have great role clarity. And I'll explain what that means if you don't know. They have accountability and they have great communication. So role clarity. And this is somewhat of a rhetorical question. I'm not asking to call anybody out or anybody to raise their hand, but each and every one of you in this room, and this includes the staff, you need to know your role on this team. You need to embrace your role on this team. And you need to work your backside off to star in your role on this team. And here's the hard part. Even if your role's not what you want it to be, even if your role's not of your preference. See, your role on this team is what Coach Oates and the rest of the staff need it to be for the team to be successful. So you need to work to star in your role to the best of your ability, but then you come in during the unseen hours to work towards a bigger role. If you don't like your role on the team, if you think you should be a starter and you're not a starter, there's nothing wrong with thinking that. But you have to embrace being a non-starter and make a maximum contribution every single day. And then you come in after hours during the unseen hours and you work on the areas of your game that might give you a potential to get more minutes or to start. You star in the role you have, you work for the role you want. Now, because you guys, again, are so analytics driven, which I think is absolutely brilliant, every single one of you needs to know what a good shot is for you. See, basketball is not an equal opportunity sport. You know who gets to shoot more? The better shooters. You know who gets to play more? The better players. It's not equal opportunity. We don't divide the number of shots by 15. Better shooters get to shoot more. So then what do you do if you want to shoot more? You become a better shooter. How do you become a better shooter? You put in the work during the unseen hours to earn the right to take more shots or to get more minutes. Star in the role you have, work for the role you want. If you think you should be able to shoot threes and at present you don't quite have that green light, then come in during the unseen hours and make three or four hundred threes before and after every single practice. You know the only result of coming in and shooting game shots from game spots at game speed every day before and after practice? You know the only result even possible from that? It's improvement. It's getting better. You make 300 free throws every day before and after practice. You know the only thing possible that will happen to your free throw percentage? It goes up. It's the only thing possible. And you guys are in control of that. Basic, right? I don't think I surprised you by saying that. You knew the answer to that, right? Is that easy to do? Is it easy to come in every single day and make an extra three? No, it's not easy to do. If it was easy, every single player on the planet would be doing it. But they don't. So there is that difference between basic and easy. Second, let's talk about accountability. I'm a huge believer that holding a teammate accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. Holding each other accountable is the best gift you guys can give each other. Holding each other accountable to the highest standard of excellence and to the core values of this program is the number one gift you can give a teammate. Now, it doesn't always feel that way in the moment. When a teammate's coming down on you and a teammate's holding you to a high standard, it's understandable to be de defensive. But just because something's understandable, it doesn't mean it's acceptable. And you have to rise above your ego to be able to take accountability from a teammate. I'm going to tell you guys this. You have an unbelievable, unparalleled coaching staff in this room right now. Some of the finest leaders I've ever met. But I'll also tell you this. A player-led team will always outperform a coach-led team in the long run. 
If the only leadership and accountability in this room comes from the coaching staff, you guys will never be the team that you're capable of becoming. It has to come from you all. And holding someone accountable is not necessarily designated by who the captains are or by who plays the most minutes or who gets the most headlines or who the best player is. If you're the 15th man on this team and you're not even on scholarship, that doesn't matter. You're still an integral part of this team and you have every right to hold everyone else in the room accountable. And you need to, you need to lean into that. So that's accountability. And then the third component is communication. Do you talk at your teammate or do you talk with your teammate? It's a big difference. You talk at them or you talk with them? Let's also look at some of the unconscious messages through communication. You're having a little bit of an off day. Practice isn't going as well as maybe you had hoped. Coach Oates or one of the other coaches gets on you a little bit. How do you respond to that? If Coach Oates is getting on you and he's looking at you and he's telling you something, what's your body language? What's your facial expressions? That speaks volumes. What happens when you look someone in the eye, you nod, and you accept the coaching that they care enough to give you? What's the unconscious message you send to Coach Oates? If he is telling you something and you look him in the eye and say, yes, sir, and you nod your head, what's the unconscious message? I trust you, Coach. I believe in you, Coach. I'm listening to you, coach. I'm gonna do the best I can to implement that, coach. That's how you strengthen relationships. What happens if you roll your eyes? You look down at the floor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I know what I'm doing. What's the unconscious message then? I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. I'm not listening to you. I don't think you're helping me. That will absolutely undermine and erode the fabric of the team. I know Coach Mo uh, Oates missing something yesterday about body language. I think at the start of practice, you missed a couple shots, right? Yeah. A couple of them were, let's be honest, way off, right? Yeah, I was watching from up there. One of them went three feet over the rim. The other one went three feet underneath the rim. Guess what? That happens. You're a phenomenal shooter. I know that because I watched you in post-practice. Do you remember what your body language was after you missed those shots? Yeah, it wasn't great. And that's, and that's understandable. You're young, right? You're a freshman? Yeah, you're young. You can course correct that. What's, what's the message you send to your teammates when you have bad body language after you miss a shot? What is it you're telling your teammates? You're selfish. Because you're only worried about you in that moment. You're mad because you missed a shot. This is a we game. It's not a me game. He didn't miss those shots yesterday. Y'all missed those shots yesterday. It's a team game. You guys win and you lose together. Good shots, bad shots, or anything in between. It's a team game. So you have to learn how to quickly bounce and move to that next play. Last thing I'll say, and I'll wrap this up. So in 2007, I had an opportunity. Uh, I, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and a good friend of mine, and your coaching staff may know Dave Bullwinkle. He's a uh, longtime scout with the Chicago Bulls. And in 2007, he sent me a text and asked if I wanted to go watch the Syracuse versus Georgetown game because Georgetown's right in my backyard. And keep in mind for context, uh, this is back when the Big East was the Big East and Syracuse and Georgetown were Syracuse and Georgetown. So he didn't have to twist my arm to go watch an elite level college game. And he texted me and he said, Alan, will you meet me at the arena at four? And I was confused because tip off was at seven. And I thought, why in the world? I mean, I believe in promptness. I try to get everywhere early. I believe if you're on time, you're late. But I thought, why in the world would we need to get somewhere at three hours before tip-off? And you know what he said? He said, I need to watch the players when they don't think anyone is watching. I need to see how they prepare and how dialed in they are for their game. Obviously, as you guys know, three hours before tip-off, you've got your walkthrough, you've got your, your warm-ups with Coach Hen, you've got other things to prepare to play. And he wanted to watch how those players were dialed in. Now, at this time, and I won't mention any player's name, you can look up the roster from 2007 on those two teams. Each team had two or three players that were potential first-round draft picks. And he took more notes during the three hours before tip-off on his yellow legal pad than he took when the game actually started. He was more interested in their preparation. He was more interested in how coachable they were, how dialed in they were. And once again, I would not mention players' names, but there were a couple of players on each team that absolutely sabotaged 
their draft stock because they weren't locked in. They were goofing around. They were going half speed. They weren't making eye contact with their coaches when their coaches were talking. You know, they're supposed to be putting up game shots from game spot at game speed and they're joking around and throwing up hook shots. They severely tarnished their draft stock. Then there were two or three other players that did the exact opposite of that. They were 100% focused. They were 100% bought in. They were 100% locked in. They were doing everything as if it mattered because everything does matter. And you guys know how it works when you're drafted in the first round of, of the NBA draft. You know, the, the contracts, your first contract has already been predetermined. There's no negotiation. You guys realize that every, every slot you drop in the first round of the NBA draft, you lose between $250,000 and $500,000 a year for the first three years of your contract. You guys know that, right? So you know if you're capable of being the 10th pick in the draft and you drop down to number 18, you just cost yourself about a million and a half dollars a year for the first three years, four and a half million dollars. Those players have no idea that they lowered their draft status and they lowered their stock and they actually lowered their bank account because they weren't behaving in a manner that elite players perform. And the reason I want to end with that story is you guys need to make the assumption that someone is always watching you. On the court or off the court, someone is always watching you and you need to behave accordingly. The moment you think you can turn it on and off, when coach is watching, that's when I'll give my best. When the cameras are on, that's when I'll give my best. When we're playing a big time opponent, that's when I'll give my best. If you believe you can turn on excellence, turn on commitment, turn on preparation, if you think you can turn it on and on like a life light switch, I'm telling you, you just undermined your ability to be the best player you're capable of. You behave in a manner as if someone is always watching you because at your level and playing at a program like this, I promise you, Someone is always watching you. So that's all I got for you guys. If there's anything else you need from me or if you guys had any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But uh, I want to be super respectful of your time. Look forward to watching practice again today. I'm going to keep an eye on you. If you miss another shot, man, I just want to see you smile and hustle back on defense. All right. So that's it for me, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Anybody got questions for him? Worked with uh, KD and stuff. Yeah, I worked with KD in high school, so I was his strength coach at Montrose Christian uh, in DC. What's your best KD story for us? What's that? What's your best KD story? Um, well, the be best story, so one that I tell a lot was about the first time I worked him out because he had never done any type of strength and conditioning before. And I, I was so excited to work with a player of his caliber that I absolutely hammered him. I mean, I know you guys have gone through some tough workouts with Hen, but I mean, in the first 20 minutes, KD was laying on the floor and he was shaking and he was twitching and he hadn't seen anything like that. Um, and I asked him if he liked the workout and as serious as can be, he looked up at me and said, no, I didn't. But he said, when can I do it again? Because he knew that doing things that he didn't necessarily want to do was the gateway to getting somewhere he wanted to get really bad, which in his case was the NBA. And I know that's the same goal that all of you had. So he was willing to make the type of sacrifice to say, you know what, I don't necessarily like getting a beat down like this a couple times a week, but I'm absolutely willing to do that because it's going to be the gateway to what it is that I want more than anything in the world. And you guys have to remember as players, you don't have to love every aspect of workouts, every aspect of practice, every aspect of nutrition, every aspect of film sessions. It's okay if you don't love every minute of that, but it's a, it's a prerequisite and it is a required sacrifice to getting where you want to go. And the short term is winning a national championship. I'm sure for most of you, the long term is having a long professional career. So just know that you have to make sacrifices in order to make that happen. So, and when I met KD, I knew he was going to be special because he had all of the physical talent. He had the fundamentals. He had the, the coachability. He had the, the basketball IQ. I mean, there was no question this kid was going to be good, but I had no idea he was going to be as good as as he's turned out to be. I mean, arguably one of the best scorers in the history of the game. But it's funny, with hindsight being 2020, looking back, I'm not even remotely surprised. You know what you get when you take an athletic, coordinated, almost seven-footer with guard-like skills, who is coachable, who is humble, 
who loves basketball more than anything in the world, who works more during the unseen hours than anyone I've ever met. You know what happens when you put all of those things together and you mix them up? You get Kevin Durant. You get one of the best players to ever play the game. So just ask yourself that. You guys have the physical tools. Do you have the coachability? Do you have the humility? Do you have the grit and resilience to make those sacrifices? Are you willing to come in early and stay late? Not when you want to, not when it's convenient, not when you feel like it, not when he makes you, but do you do that every single day? That's a question for each and every one of you. And the, if individually each of you is willing to make that, con that commitment, and then collectively, you have each other's back and you support each other and you hold each other accountable and you listen to your coaching staff, you do all of those things, you put yourself in the best position possible to win a national championship. Because don't forget, talent is not enough. The most talented team does not win every single year. Just talent is not enough. It's talent plus all of these other things and these other things are the controllable things. And you guys have the talent. You have enough talent and you have enough leadership and enough resources in this room to win a national championship. You realize there's only about 25 schools in the country that can say that. 300 plus teams in the country do not have the talent, do not have the coaching, and do not have the resources to give themselves a chance to win a national championship. And I don't say that to diminish them, I say that because it's real. You are not one of those schools. You have all of the, the prerequisites to winning it. Now it just comes down to the commitment each and every one of you makes. Have a good practice. Have a good day. Appreciate you guys.